بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد السلام عليكم to everyone who may be tuning in to this short video and anyone who may be passing by wanting to listen in as well uh, so in this video I'm going to be continuing to talk about the subject of modernity and I'm going to be doing a little bit of a commentary on Marshall Berman's book All That Is Solid melts into air. It's an excellent book. He was um, pro-modernist and uh, it gives you an idea of the kind of idealism that existed uh, pre-1960s um, which gave rise to quite a lot of hideous architecture globally. So I'm just going to go over some more points that he makes in his book uh, because well, one of the reasons is that when people talk about their conversion to Islam, a lot of the time they don't talk about the historical environment, the, the historical context in which they were raised. And there are many global trends that have taken place over the last century, which a lot of people don't understand we have been influenced by certain personalities in our history, certain architects of the kind of society that we're living in now. And a lot of the time we don't know who those architects are and uh, we don't know what their philosophies are and we don't know how they have shaped the world in which we are living today. So. Sometimes conversion to Islam can be a kind of instinctive reaction to things that you see are wrong in your society or things that you feel, but you may not be able to exactly pinpoint or articulate what those problems are. And so it helps to read into who are the main thinkers of the last few centuries in order for us to better understand the situation that we are in and of course then understand what we need to do in response to the problems that we are facing. So Marshall Berman says that, so he's he's a dedicated, or he was because he's passed away, um, and uh, he um, he was a dedicated modernist uh, and uh, he chose to remain a modernist all through the new postmodern movement. So we haven't really talked about what postmodernism is um, and uh, maybe we will touch upon that in future videos as well. Uh, so, page 9 of Marshall Berman's book, he says that some readers may think that I give short shrift to the vast accumulation of contemporary discourse around the idea of post-modernity. This discourse began to emanate from France in the late 70s, largely from the disillusioned rebels of 1968 moving in the orbit of post-structuralism. Roland Barthes, Michel Foucault, Jacques Derrida, Jean-François Lyotard and Jean Baudrillard and their legions of followers. In the late 1980s, postmodernism became a staple of aesthetic and literary discussion in the USA. So we can at some point try to understand more what postmodernism is. And uh, Marshall Berman says that postmodernists may be said to have developed a paradigm that clashes sharply with the one in this book, meaning his book. I have argued that modern life and art and thought have the capacity for perpetual self critique and self renewal. Postmodernists maintain that the horizon of modernity is closed, its energies exhausted in effect, that modernity is passé. Postmodernist social thought pours scorn 
on all the collective hopes for moral and social progress, for personal freedom and public happiness that were bequeathed to us by the modernists of the 18th century enlightenment. These hopes, postmoderns say, have been shown to be bankrupt, at best vain and futile. He says, there is one modern sentiment that I regret not exploring in greater depth. I am talking about the widespread and often desperate fear of freedom that modernity opens up for every individual. And I, I really question that modernity opens up freedom for every individual. I mean, does he literally mean every individual on the planet? So in my previous videos, I have shown that due to um, economic corruption and what is now known as modern day slavery, modernity does not open up freedom for every individual. Maybe um, individuals in the North and actually now even in the North, we have quite widespread modern day slavery, so to speak. So I don't know who he's thinking of when he says that modernity opens up freedom for every individual. And, uh, and so he talks about the desire to escape from freedom by any means possible. This distinctively modern darkness was first mapped by Dostoevsky in his parable of the Grand Inquisitor in the Brothers Karamazov in 1881. Man prefers peace, the Inquisitor says, and even death to freedom of choice in the knowledge of good and evil. There is nothing more seductive for man than his freedom of conscience, but nothing that is a greater cause of suffering. And then Berman says, so many demagogues and demagogic movements have won power and mass adoration by relieving the peoples they rule of the burden of freedom. The fascist regimes of 1922 to 1945 may turn out to be only a first chapter in the still unfolding history of radical authoritarianism. My response to what Berman is saying, uh, I mean, there's, there's been this idea put out there that um, modernity opens up the horizon for every individual and that it opens up a vista of freedom. It, it enables us to exercise our free will and our freedom of conscience. And that what is actually happening is that rather than embrace the potentialities of this freedom that has been introduced into human society, human beings cannot bear the burden and the responsibility of freedom of choice and of being free. And so they go rushing over to a strong man and hand over their freedom to this strong man. And they prefer, they choose to be enslaved rather than free, right? So I have some issues with this argument. As I've said, I don't know who Marshall Berman is referring to when he says that modern life, whatever that may mean, brings freedom to every individual. So that point I've already made. Because there are so many people who are enslaved in so many ways. Then there's also this idea of freedom of choice, which I have touched upon before and which I saw in a book by Noam Chomsky that he also mentions it, that do we really have freedom of choice or are our choices being controlled for us? For example, when I look back at the culture in which I was raised, so born in the 1970s, grew up in the 1980s, 1990s, as a teenager and, and coming into my 20s, and you grow up 
within the parameters of a certain culture and you don't know that there is any other way. You don't know that it's possible to step outside of the parameters of that culture into another culture. And it could be said that when I converted to Islam, Islam in some ways, yes, it allows for a great variety of cultures within its parameters, but it still consists of a certain moral code and it does establish a certain kind of culture. So say Islamic culture, an Islamic way of life, or attempting to be an Islamic way of life, then that's when you discover that actually you're not supposed to be doing that. When a, a, a Westerner who's been raised in a so-called liberal democracy with so-called freedom of choice um, steps out of that because they can see that actually um, the choices that we have available to us are highly controlled by the culture that has been cultivated by corporations. We have, as I've said before, an artificial culture. We are living, in effect, in a kind of um, aquarium. I won't say goldfish bowl, but it's an aquarium that is not really in touch with the reality of what it is to be a human being. And so oftentimes people can feel that they're living in this artificial reality, this stage set, this film set that we're, we're living in, that we're meant to believe is real. And um, when you see that, oh, I'm just living in a stage set, I'm living in a film set, and I'm, and I'm kind of supposed to accept that it's real and believe that it's real like everybody else does. Uh, and uh, you say, well, this life is precious, like I was given this existence, so what, am I going to spend my whole life living in a film set and pretending that this artificial way of life is a real way of life just to keep everybody happy? No, because this existence is too precious to do that. So you, you then exercise your freedom of choice to step out of these coordinates, to step out of these parameters you're exercising your freedom of choice to go into the uh, Islamic way of life, which um, is, we could say for some people, is a way of life that connects you to what is more real. It connects you to the reality of what it is to be a human being. That's why a lot of people convert. And so when you go into a way of life that connects you uh, with the reality of what it is to be a human being, that's when you get the protests from the people that are adhering to this artificial way of life. You know, you get the objections to your choice by people who say, but, you know, you, like, you've got freedom of choice. You've got freedom. So why, why are you choosing, you, why are you using your, your freedom of choice to, to choose this thing? And it's like, well, I didn't know that there were rules and restrictions on how I should be exercising my freedom of choice. Isn't freedom of choice freedom of choice in all cases? Or is it just freedom of choice in, 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 in ways that are designated appropriate for me to choose? So Berman might have argued that, um, Rebecca, you're afraid of freedom and that's why you're adopting a way of life that's full of rules and regulations. You know, you're afraid of freedom. But the irony is that, um, okay, technically I might have freedom, but I'm still constricted by the parameters by the coordinates of the culture in which I've been raised, which is a lot of the time a fake culture.
I just don't want a fake culture. And I don't want a culture where there's so much freedom of choice in certain areas that uh, what I have found with, with certain freedoms of choice is that what it means in society is that uh, the, the people who have a strong personality or a manipulative personality can dominate those who are not in such a strong position. So there is no actual equality of freedom of choice in society because what Berman is overlooking is the fact that we don't all have the same personalities. We don't all have the same social power in society. Okay, so I have said that uh, in response to what Berman is saying here is that, is this really the right argument? Is there a fear of freedom or is it that people turn to strong authoritarian figures when economies have failed, when they see the moral collapse of their society and when they feel that their ideals and themselves have been betrayed? I think this is why people turn to strong men or women, why people turn to authoritarian figures. It's when they've had enough of the corruption in their society and they don't see a strong enough person or people to address that corruption and along comes a strong man or woman with what looks like an authoritarian personality claiming that they can change things radically well of course people are going to go to that person they're going to say yeah we've put up with high inflation unemployment the rich ripping us off loss of our identity, loss of our culture. We've, we've put up with that for long enough. You're saying you can fix it, so we'll support you. It's got nothing to do with a fear of freedom of choice or a fear of freedom. Uh, and then, so I say in, in response to that, when they have been unhappy for a long time with the direction in which their societies are heading, and also when they feel they have been humiliated and lost their sense of identity and respect in the world, that's when they go towards this so-called authoritarian figure. So Berman seems to be blind to what the issues are here. And this is something that I think even today, in today's global climate, modernity in the last 100 years or 150 years has not been neutral in terms of the culture that it has exported around the world. And I have studied the impact of modernity uh, on mainly uh, Chinese, Japanese and some African cultures because modernity brought with it a specific culture, um, mainly a secular European or we could say, yeah, secular European dash American culture. That's what was exported around the world. And this is what has erased people's sense of themselves. That's what has erased their sense of identity and history and culture. And this modern European dash American culture has also exported itself around the world as something that is superior to everybody else's culture. And so people who are on the receiving end of this mission to modernize the world, they're also on the receiving end of a subliminal message that is saying that your culture is inferior, your identity is inferior, your history is inferior, you are inferior. And so you have to be like us in order to be advanced, progressive, and modern. And this is kind of the great gaslighting exercise that has gone on globally for the last 150 years. So yes, I challenge this idea that um, people, people who are not very impressed by certain enlightenment ideals uh, I, challenge, I challenge the idea that um, 
they reject or they question these ideals because they're afraid of freedom. Rather, what people object to is the exportation of the culture that comes with those ideals. And actually, I think that even the Enlightenment thinkers that were trying to fight for these ideals, they themselves might not have been too happy with how things have turned out culturally since they started to espouse those ideals. So Berman says um, that in All That Is Solid Melts Into Air, I try to open up a perspective that will reveal all sorts of cultural and political movements as part of one process. Modern men and women asserting their identity in the present, even a wretched and oppressive present, and their right to control their future, striving to make a place for themselves in the modern world, a place where they can feel at home. From this point of view, the struggles of democracy that are going on all over the contemporary world are central to modernism's meaning and power. And my question, or my response, to these points that Berman makes are that with the development of modern economies, the destruction of the extended family that has come about because of the development of modern economies, enforced migration, which has come about because of the development of modern economies and loss of uh, spiritual tradition. How can we make ourselves feel at home? So he's saying that, um, you know, the mo in the modern world, like, you know, the thing to do is kind of like campaign for democracy and, you know, freedom and equality. And like, we're just trying to make ourselves at home in the modern world. It's like, yeah, but why do we not feel at home in the modern world in the first place? It's because the mechanisms of modernity have destroyed our home. The development of the modern economy, which has brought people out of the countryside into the cities, broken up families, and brought about war and displacement because of greed and the desire to enrich certain economies, and the entertainment industry that has also seduced the youth away from their families and inculcated in them a contempt and disrespect for their elders and for their ancestors and for their ancestral culture. All of that has brought about an environment in which we don't feel at home. And then, and then ironically, Berman is saying, oh, as modern men and women, we're trying to make ourselves feel at home in the modern world. Yeah, the modern world that has destroyed our sense of what it is to be at home because of the way that modern world has been created. So these are some of my uh, thoughts today with regard to modernity. And um, inshallah, I will continue to have some discussion using Marshall Berman's book as a kind of springboard or a starting point by which to have this discussion. And inshallah, I will be loading up more videos with regard to modernity, modern life, post-modernity, mm -hmm. and to think about the kind of world in which we are living and how we should be in this world. So thank you for listening and inshallah, I will see you in the next video. Assalamu alaikum.